Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh, my voice is loud. Um, this is the first live fast pitch session in three years. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to have you all here. You know, we heard Copham Diem this morning. I thought of it's a lot easier to believe that when you have a lot of other people with you. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm Bob Ledoux, and I'm a program director here at Opera E, and I will be your MC for this session on uh, this fast pitch session on transportation systems. I only have one note before we begin, and that is the format is that we'll have all the fast pitch presentations, and that's followed by a question and answer period. But I don't have my, my badge anymore. But throughout the, um, the fast pitches, please um, submit your questions, and they'll be queued up, and we'll have them all at the end. So that's it. Well, I'm already standing, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off this fast pitch session. Um, and I would like to discuss with you today, uh, here it goes, trustworthy AI for critical transportation and energy systems. And basically, this is both a reflection on under what circumstances we allow artificial intelligence to take control of these systems, or at least partial control, and also a call to action for all of us of what part are we going to play in that transformation. So ever since the inception of general purpose intelligence, we dreamed of the promise of artificial intelligence while we also feared it. And in popular culture, let's face it, it never turns out well. But artificial intelligence did enter our lives. It's here every day when we do social media, when we do online shopping, uh, when we get our weather forecast, when we get a medical diagnosis. All in those circumstances, artificial intelligence is an agent behind the scenes. And since this is transportation uh, section, of course, many of you probably out here in the audience are working on autonomous vehicles, say, not just in roads, but also in maritime, rail, um, and aviation. Now, um, all of these examples so far, a human is in the loop, right? You, you choose to click on the keyboard. You're supposed to keep your hands on the steering wheel. But as we move forward into the bright future of a sustainable, clean transportation system that's efficient, powered by the smart grid, and we heard a wonderful talk this morning by Dr. Merfeld on the advantages of the smart grid and its need and its challenges. The question I pose to all of you, is artificial intelligence crucial for the smart grid? And I'm going to give you my answer. Yes, it is. And why? These are very complex systems. They contain billions of sensors which must be processed into actionable information. Olga is going to be speaking later about, about sensors. They may have, these, these networks may have millions of interacting nodes, and the, the real-time control goes from milliseconds to long-term predictions. So I think the answer is, and let's at least presume that for now, the answer is yes, we need it. The question is, how do we adopt it? Do we welcome it with open arms and saying we need it, therefore we do our best to make it safe and so on, let's use it? or? Do we fear it and say that maybe we just got to get the whole story right up front before we implement it? Well, I'm going to propose to you a balancing act. We, it, climate change, for example, is too critical to wait for the perfect solution. We need to balance societal needs against the performance and resiliency we hope to get from these systems with AI. So that's what I'd like to continue talking to you about. Now, this, this formulation framework goes under trustworthy, responsible AI. It has many names, and there's many organizations working on it. And in fact, I think if you look at just the sampling here, you see that um, AI is so important to so much of what we want to do in the future that it's represented by these groups, and most of them are working on a framework to do it. So you may ask, wow, you know, you know a solution by committee. But my personal opinion, it's converging. There are root concepts that I think most of these groups are adopting. And they have to do with things like scalability, security, accountability, ethical principles, and so on. And so I think there is some harmony, harmonization here. And I'd like to just take three examples and work them through for a few use cases. So I think we should all agree AI should be ethical. It should promote justice. It must avoid discrimination. It should be understandable. I mean, first, I guess we have to understand what we want it to do. But certainly, we have to understand how it works. Uh, and it has to ensure that we know who controls it. It must be safe, 
But what's new in these big interconnected systems doesn't work as advertised under all conditions, many of them potentially unforeseen. So I'd like to take these three principles and kind of work them through a few use cases. So first, let's take some examples from transportation. We want transportation, this autonomous vehicle, say. They should make ethical decisions, and their decisions should be explainable. And this picture on the left is the um, trolley problem brought to the 21st century, where you can see there are only bad choices, right? So how is AI supposed to make a decision into those cases? And it will, and if it makes a mistake, how do we explain it? And for society to accept this, I think it both needs to, to work, but it, it will have accidents. It needs to be explainable. A technical issue here is that presently, there is a trade-off between performance in AI algorithms and their explainability. And we're not sure if that's intrinsic or not, probably isn't. When we look to the larger transportation system, and Jake's going to present some new ideas there, we encounter new problems. If we want to integrate and make a more efficient supply chain, saying, uh, supply chain, then of course we may have new emergent behaviors. And not all emergent behaviors are, are good, some are bad. So how do we ensure that this is designed to work in spite of both unforeseen circumstances or emergent behaviors? And of course, no one predicted COVID, so we know it can happen. Now my last examples come from the smart grid, right? We, we, we call it the smart grid. And presumably part of that is because it takes vast amounts of data, right, to balance things like supply and demand. But let's face it, some of that data is your data and it's my data. And the question is, who governs that data access and how are you sure we know how it will be used? And if there was ever a breach, who's responsible? When we look at the smart grid writ large, there's many questions about equability and so on, particularly about local and global trade-offs. There's energy rich regions, there's energy poor regions, and a, and a, and a failure and a cascading failure, you may want to island off your own little place to keep it secure, but you've got to bring the grid back up, et cetera. So there's a lot of issues that those types of trade-offs have to be placed into the AI. Um, and in particular, there may be a lot of uncertainty, and it's important to know when to put a human in the loop. So this is my last slide, and I guess this is a punchline of sorts, and that is trustworthy AI centers on, first and foremost, we understand it, and we need to know what it wanted to do. Second, it can't be an add-on. It can't be a bolt-on or an afterthought. If we're going to make this acceptable and ha have it trustworthy, we need to design it into the system. And third, although we would love to have a whole set of standards, framework, ready-made that we can work to, it doesn't exist. So it is our responsibility to contribute to this solution. We are building, many of you in the audience are building architectures. Are they private? Are they secure? Are they accountable? We, we have many algorithms that we're using. Are they truly impartial and are they explainable? Do you know why they made a decision? I think human beings want to know that. And of course, these are complicated dynamic systems, right? They're smart, they learn. Well, how do we validate a system that effectively is changing? Um, you know, there's a lot of good thinking on this, but it's certainly not nailed down. And finally, we mentioned un uncertainty quantification. It would be great if intrinsically these AI systems knew the, the uncertainty they were operating under, and maybe, for instance, put a human in a loop when it's appropriate to put a human in the loop. So, so that's it. I would just say, you know, trust is not going to emerge. Society's not just going to accept this blindly. We all need to carry the water and contribute to such a solution. And so I would just say thank you for your attention. I'd love to continue this discussion, both at the summit and beyond. Uh, and now, it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and fellow program director, Dr. Olga Spahn, um, for the next presentation. Olga. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. Um, I'm Olga Spahn, RPE program director. And today, I'd like to talk to you about wireless power transfer. So imagine what could you do if you could safely and efficiently transfer any amount of power without constraint of a physical wire. What would that enable? I will use IoT as an example of potential benefit that could bring, uh, discuss some technology challenges uh, and opportunities, and address other 
application that may emerge at, as we mature that technology. So IoT is a good example because it can have profound implications for sustainability, and there is a lot of it. In fact, by 2030, as many as 20 half and a, 25 and a half billion of connected devices. All those devices are gonna cost some energy to produce and to use. In fact, about 0.65 petawatt hours by 2030. But they have potential to save a lot more energy than that, either through direct uh, energy savings uh, due to energy efficiency improvements or avoidance of hydrocarbon fuel use. Um, IoT could save as much as 58% of all energy needs from the information and communications technology by 2030. And that's not counting about a gigaton of CO2 emissions uh, that could be saved. Most of those savings come from enterprise IoT in the areas such as power generation, uh, grid uh, operations, uh, factory automation, building efficiency, and so on. So IoT has multiple parts. Uh, I'm gonna start with the decision maker, or the brains of the operation, if you will. That's the part that Bob was describing that has uh, potentially artificial intelligence and machine learning in it. And it needs to be connected to edge devices, to sensors that supply data and actuators that carry out decisions based on, a, uh, based on that data. Uh, those sensors and actuators, the edge devices, they need to be powered. And today that means uh, batteries for sensors and wired connections for actuators or else really big batteries. And it turns out that how we power the edge devices greatly determines what they can do <clears throat> in terms of how many you can have, how far apart they can be, uh, how hungry a power task they can carry out. In fact, um, our ability to distribute some of that decision making to the edge, which is required for autonomy, is also dependent how well we can supply power. Uh, furthermore, how much data we can send is limited by that power and how well the data can be secured. You heard earlier today about cybersecurity as a requirement. Um, authentication and encryption will cost power. So what are we to do? I would propose that wireless power transfer can potentially offer a way out of this conundrum. So there are many ways to send power wirelessly, it turns out. We will not be talking about the uh, near field power transfer, such as that exemplified by uh, uh, inductive or magnetic or capacitive power coupling because it's limited to short distances by physics and it's, all, it's commercial, it's available. Instead, I will focus on long distance radiative electromagnetic power transfer, which can happen at wavelengths between RF to optical and anything in between. The physics is very similar. Uh, what's different is the physical implementation and technology by which that is implemented. And in fact, there are trade-offs depending on the choice of the wavelength made. So how can we improve uh, prospects for wireless power transfer? I believe it starts with good definitions of potential use cases and requirements associated with them, specifically uh, nailing down the wavelength, which will then help us narrow down the technology uh, needs. It turns out that pretty much across the board in, in terms of the spectrum, uh, efficiencies need help. Uh, they're barely in double digits today, and a record of uh, just over 50% was set back in 1975 in the RF regime. So that's an area to focus on is those improvements. But luckily, we can leverage technology improvements in adjacent areas. For example, uh, optical transmission can be improved by leveraging uh, developments in solid state lasers and semiconductor lasers that have been advanced for laser machining and optical communications. Uh, wide band gap power electronics can be uh, utilized to help in improving efficiency in the RF regime uh, using power amplifiers for the transmitters and uh, rectifying diodes in uh, receiving and other things. And furthermore, we can use ideas uh, in phased arrays, metamaterials, high power optics, non-Gaussian uh, beam propagation to improve uh, beam transmission efficiency. And we cannot forget about safety. Technologies that improve safety and help manage interference are also very important. So as we improve our ability to transfer uh, 
power over distance, we can unlock a number of applications. Industry sensors and actuators are required for Industry 4.0 in order to improve efficiency, uh, to reduce waste and emissions, to enable things like predictive maintenance and digital twins. And those may be in harsh or mobile environments like you will be hearing about from my colleague uh, Jake Russell's talk next. As we uh, improve ability to transfer power over longer distance, we can unlock remote applications that cover larger spatial areas like remote, like uh, smart agriculture or offshore wind. And we may choose to cover those distances with wireless drones, or perhaps we'll be coupling them to local renewable resources like solar farms or wind farms. If, um, as we improve ability to even more power, we can unlock applications in emergency power delivery, like in a disaster relief situation, where you might want to beam some power to power uh, communications infrastructure, or perhaps develop uh, flexible distribution networks that allow us to deliver power on demand. In short, the more power we can transfer efficiently over longer distances, the more of these applications emerge. And to that end, I'd like to ask you, the audience, to help identify what are the appropriate use cases, what would this mean for your business, what's the killer app? And for technologists, how can we improve performance in terms of efficiency, improved safety, and lower cost? Please find me and let's talk about it. That's all I have, and I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jake Russell. Hey everybody, today I'd like to ask a question that we've all asked at some point in our lives. Is bigger always better when it comes to moving freight? Here's a schematic of our current intermodal system. Long haul transportation going you know, across the oceans, we import goods into our ports with large cargo ships. The middle mile then going from the port to say the distribution center across the country could be done with trucks or typically trains. The last mile then is typically done with trucks, right? Getting that good to the doorstep. However, this middle mile is not split equally. It's actually dominated by trucking. We use trucking about for about 70% of our uh, cargo container movement for that middle mile. Why do we do this? It comes down to service quality. Trucks can provide excellent service quality for delivering goods, which I like to break down into the three Fs. They can provide fast, frequent, and flexible delivery of goods. Furthermore, for, furthermore, they get us very close to the last mile of delivery, as well as fitting very well into the modular container system that makes up our intermodal system today. However, this service quality comes with a trade-off. Trucking is an inefficient and expensive mode of transportation when compared to other modes like rail and water. Whether you look at the cost per ton mile or the energy use per ton mile, trucking is about five times worse off than its companions. This combined with our over-reliance on trucking, this is not, there we go, uh, results in over 5% of total US energy use used for moving goods by truck. So the question is, is there an opportunity here for modal shift from truck to the more efficient modes of rail and water? And in doing so, saving an enormous amount of energy. So rail and water, in order to achieve this you know, better efficiency, lower cost, have historically become aggregated or scaled up. Over the last 50 to 100 years, we've seen ships become larger and larger and larger, as well as trains becoming longer and longer. And this has been done for two reasons. One, labor efficiency. We can move more goods with fewer people if we have larger vessels, as well as energy efficiency. We can move more goods with larger engines uh, with, with less energy. But this aggregation, this increased scale comes with drawbacks. As we saw last year and continuing even today, the increased scale and aggregation of these modes of freight has led to increasing bottlenecks and plugs in our logistics system, which leads to the opposite of fast, frequent, and flexible transportation. 
Meaning if we want to compete with trucks and induce this modal shift, we're going to have to change some things. So right, in, right now we have two options. If we look at the number of containers moved versus efficiency on this left axis, also compared with service quality on the other axis, we have two opposite ends of the spectrum. One end, very inefficient movement, but high service quality, we have trucks. And then at the other end, where we have many, many containers, we have very poor service quality, but very efficient movement. So what if we could find a sweet spot here that can uh, provide both high service quality of trucks as well as the lower energy and cost of rail and water? The answer here is disaggregation. Breaking down these historically aggregated and then scaled up modes into smaller or modular and interconnected networks that allow us to provide a more flexible and efficient transport system. Disaggregation could find the sweet spot of service quality and efficiency, providing this third option for freight transport, smaller and speedier chunks with the efficiency of the aggregated modes of rail and water. Rail and water movement has intrinsic physical benefit uh, over rubber on road that trucks provide. These networks would also allow us to move away from the traditional hub and spoke model towards a more resilient and interconnected mesh and node system. And finally, our freight system, our intermodal system is already set up for this kind of modular transportation because we use containers. This Shift is enabled by the convergence of three technology developments which have only just become realized. One, autonomous vehicles allows us to completely do away with the need for the labor efficiency and the need for scaling up that has historically been a driving factor for that aggregation. It's not just gonna be trucks that are autonomous, it's gonna be our large freight uh, vehicles as well. Secondly, the Internet of Things or IoT that Olga mentioned, the connected uh, vehicles to infrastructure, vehicles to vehicles, allow us to manage these more modular interconnected systems uh, with speed and efficiency, as well as, like Bob talked about, the logistics optimization power to efficiently manage these systems as well. So what would a disaggregated intermodal future look like? Well, again, I'm not talking about disaggregating long haul shipping. It still makes sense to keep those things on you know, the enormous ships going across the Pacific Ocean. I'm also not talking about the last mile, which in the future will still be done by truck or possibly drone. But what I'm talking about is the middle mile. Disaggregated rail is being worked on. One of our portfolio companies, Parallel Systems, as well as others are developing autonomous electric rail cars and bogies that can move on their own as well as convoy. Disaggregated water systems could look something like this, developing in, in, in DARPA program C-Train, uh, allowing for autonomous ship and barge convoys that can move up and down coasts or inland waterways. And finally, an integral part of the system is the micro-terminal or micro-port, a low-cost distributed intermodal site that allows for the transition from the middle mile to the last mile without the reliance on our classic ports. The impact here could be enormous. Just looking at truck movement on the east and west coast, we see about 40 terawatt hours per year. And it's even more on the interior of the country. But we have an enormous underutilized and highly penetrating infrastructure network in our rail system on the left and our inland waterway system on the right, as well as our coasts. So in conclusion here, bigger is not always better when it comes to freight transportation. With this new paradigm, we could expect to see an energy reduction via modal shift from trucking to rail and water, as well as an increased resilience and performance of our intermodal system. The future of freight transport is modular, autonomous, and connected, and it will allow us to provide service that is fast, frequent, and flexible. If you have any interest in how we can realize this future of freight transportation, please reach out. My email is here. And I'd like to introduce next my colleague, Dr. Peter DeBach. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, I assume that most of you came here by plane yesterday or the day before. And if you did so, it's very likely that your plane left a trail in the sky. My name is Peter de Bock, and I'd like to talk to you about understanding and mitigation of the av aviation contrails. 
Now, instead of going to 30,000 foot, I want to invite you to go further and look at the Earth from space. The atmosphere provides a unique thermal barrier between the extreme cold of space and Earth. And the sun radiates the Earth, but if more solar radiation uh, gets absorbed by the Earth and reflected, the Earth heats up, global warming. We call this also net radiative forcing. Gases in the atmosphere play an important role in the absorption and reflection properties of the atmosphere. And one gas in particular we'll hear a lot about this week, and that is carbon dioxide or CO2. We need to reduce and eliminate the emissions of this greenhouse gas. The aviation sector by itself is responsible for about 2% of all the CO2 production and with that is responsible for about 34 milliwatts per meter square of radiative forcing. But there's another molecule we do not often talk about that also comes from aviation and also has a significant effect on, on uh, global warming. And that is water. Or be, to be more precise, water vapor and ice crystals in the form of contrails at high altitudes emitted by aircraft. Although ice crystals are very pretty, uh, they also block infrared radiation. And the science says that the contribution of contrails can be as significant as CO2 for this particular sector. Now, there's a large error bar on this prediction. That means there's still a lot to learn. But even in the most conservative estimates, it's still significant. Now, I do want to be clear, our primary focus should still be CO2 because it's a long-term greenhouse gas meaning that once it's in the atmosphere, it's very hard to remove. But water vapor and ice crystals as contrails during the time that they become persistent, and sometimes they dissipate, but sometimes they can be as persistent as six to 10 hours, they contribute a similar amount of radiative forcing as CO2 does from the sector. And therefore, it deserves our attention. Now, let me tell you three things about contrails. Contrails comes from the word condensation trails. Uh, frozen water, ice crystals that form at high altitudes behind our aircraft. And our future might be sustainable aviation fuels, hydrogen, maybe even batteries. Um, but if we go for sustainable aviation fuels or hydrogen, it's very likely that we're going to produce more water in the future. And depending on the atmospheric properties, the way the combustion process works, and the water production, contrails can either dissipate quickly or they can become persistent. And we need to understand that better, because if we are looking for sustainable aviation fuels to be our future, we do not want to create more contrails and produce more radiative forcing while we reduce the CO2 uh, problem. Now, contrails are a, a, a challenging scientific problem, and I've got some great images here for you. On the right, we see an aircraft, the Boeing 787, at high altitude, producing zero contrails. On the left, we see an, the same aircraft in a different situation at high altitude, producing massive water clouds. Yes, I love this video. It's very exciting to see, but it's, it's big. And, and I invite you to actually go see this full video online. It's, it's very uh, interesting to see. But this pilot probably doesn't even know that he's producing contrails, and he certainly doesn't know whether they're persistent or not. Because if you're traveling 500 miles per hour, how do you know whether the water clouds you generate are going to be there six to 10 hours later? Some great work is already starting. Uh, this is some work from Vincent Meyer and Stephen Barrett from MIT, who took a large amount of satellite data and used advanced AI algorithms over two years to identify contrails in the U United States. And you can see uh, flight paths, different trajectories, but this is just the beginning, and we need more work like this to understand the effect and nature of, of contrails. So, it's clear to me that contrails are significant today, and they could be even more significant in the future. If we look towards hydrogen combustion as one of the potential solutions for future sustainable aviation, the math is simple. You're going to produce 100% water. But contrails get formed through a number of conditions. It's like the atmospheric conditions is extremely cold. It's combustion byproducts that form nucleation sites, and it's a total water production. And when we're looking at the future of sustainable aviation fuels and hydrogen, uh, there'll be more water, but there'll also be less uh, combustion byproducts or maybe none. So the total balance of control production of the future still needs to be better understood. 
My dream vision is that a pilot flying at high altitude while he flies has a particular light on his cockpit dashboard that as soon as a control gets produced, that at that point contributes to radiator forcing, that light comes on. And in my dream, it also, he would have a switch right next to it. He can flip a switch and turn that control off by managing some kind of technology that still needs to be invented. So both the sensor and the mitigation technologies do not exist today. But I'm, I'm excited about those because if we could develop those, we could eliminate the entire radiative forcing equivalent to CO2. And it, to me, it seems maybe easier to do. I'd like to turn that switch and turn that control off. Uh, for that, we need a, a suite of sensors that can help us understand, are we producing a control, and is it going to be persistent? Now, that's pretty hard. Maybe seeing if you produce a control could be just a camera looking out at, at the back of the aircraft. But the persistency part could maybe require a suite of sensors, either on the ground, airborne, or even from space. And combining that with other flight data, metadata that's, that's available for a particular flight, aircraft model, engine type, could be trained to make a trustworthy AI model that could help that pilot really identify in the future with maybe a minimal set of sensors, now I'm producing something that harms the Earth. And when we reach that point, we can look further and see what methods we can explore to mitigate that. Clear skies keep the Earth at the right temperature, and frankly, they make me happy. So do you have ideas that can help identify persistent contrails and mitigate them? Please contact me. And there's some already some great people that have some great ideas already, like my colleague, Dr. Halle Cheesman. He's got the ultimate control-free solution flying on batteries, but he needs your help. I look forward to your talk, Halle. Thank you for your introduction, Peter, and good afternoon to you all. Some of you drove to the airport, or maybe even drove here, in an electric vehicle. For every kilogram of battery in that electric vehicle, you can drive the grand total of three quarters of a mile. The battery energy density is about 200 watt hours per kilogram, and you need many hundreds of kilograms to get yourself any reasonable range. Well, when we talk about electrifying aviation, maybe with batteries, 200 watt hours just ain't gonna cut it. We need something closer to 1,000 watt hours per kilogram to even get something that's interesting. We need battery 1K. So you see that on the chart here on the left to illustrate the point. Um, commercial aviation is about how many passengers can you carry and how far can you carry them safely. And you can see 200 watt hours per kilogram is pretty miserable. It's not only until we get to 1,000 watt hours per kilogram, 1K, that we start seeing something reasonable. And you can see what impact this would have if it existed. Here we have two circles, radius 700 nautical miles, one centered on Denver, one centered on Chicago, and you could see we would have something pretty significant if we could get that kind of range from a battery. What would that do for us? Well, amongst other things, we would be able to save maybe as much as 70 million tons per year of carbon dioxide emissions. And that, of course, is just the USA. So well, how might we do that? Well, in batteries, you can consider the metals, the anodes, as fuels. And you can see something like lithium actually is pretty close to jet fuel. The problem, of course, is we can kick out the emissions from jet fuel, but we couldn't really kick out lithium hydroxide or lithium oxide from the back of the plane. I don't think that would be very popular with the people down below. So we actually have to live with lower energy densities once we include the oxidized version of the metal keeping it on board the plane. But you notice for lithium and aluminum and magnesium here, we still are way above that one kilowatt hour per kilogram target. So this is practical solution as percent of theoretical. We only need 19% for lithium as a percent of uh, experimental versus, uh, versus theoretical to achieve our 1K target. So today's question is, how can we package these metals as anodes in batteries to achieve 1K? And when I say package, I'm probably using that word more loosely than has ever been used before. There are some significant challenges. 
one option in terms of a battery would be a metal air battery. There are other solutions as well, but in the interest of time today, we're just going to look very quickly at the metal air battery. We have a metal anode. The metal donates electrons. We have an air cathode. The cathode helps oxygen receive those electrons. And then in the electrical energy so generated, we have the energy to, to, to power our plane. The metals themselves, we can regenerate. We may send them back to the smelter after each use, or alternatively, in some cases, we can electrically recharge them. Probably for an airplane, we need something bigger than the charger shown here. Now, zinc air doesn't have the energy density that we need, but it's been around for a long time and it's been used for an eclectic mixture of applications, and so we can learn from it. You can see that it gets to about 27% of its theoretical in the 300 watt hours per kilogram that it's able to deliver in terms of energy density. If we were to apply that to lithium and aluminum, you see we blow past our 1,000 watt hours per kilogram target. We exceed the 1K if we can do the same on zinc, as we, same on lithium and aluminum as we've done on zinc air. Lots of challenges though, of course, right? We wouldn't be talking about it in R3 if there weren't lots of challenges. We have a whole bunch of anode challenges as you see on the slide here. On the cathode side, we have the fundamental reversibility of a catalyst that at some point we want to affect the oxygen reduction reaction, but when we regenerate that anode, it has to evolve oxygen. Oh, and let's talk about the air. Air is not, of course, oxygen and benign nitrogen. It's got contaminants in it. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, and we have to deal with those. Fortunately, there's lots of solutions that have been developed over the years. We have to be clever enough to find the good ones and integrate them together in a system. Over the last uh, 10 years, there's been thousands of journal articles and hundreds of patents on these kind of topics. University of Delaware, an open 2018 performer, you can go and visit them at booth 404. They have an electrochemical carbon dioxide separator. Ultimately, we have to be involved with system thinking. This isn't about solving problems just with individual components, but we have to manage it as a system. Unashamedly, I show you a patent which has my name on it, which involves an air manager. So air can be a problem, but I only actually need it when I'm actually running the plane. I don't need it there the rest of the time so I can talk about innovations that isolate it. And the great thing about batteries, which has kept me in the business for so long, is it's always about trade-offs. There's going to be things in aviation that we need to bring to the fore and focus on, and there's going to be other things that we can move to, to a back seat that maybe we can consider less important. Most important thing is we're going to have to rethink batteries and we're going to have to rethink planes. You can see that in the auto industry, that the companies who really are pushing the boundaries on what batteries can do EVs have basically said we need to start from a clean sheet of paper. So to conclude, lead acid has been around 150 years, very low energy density. Lithium ion, 31 years, coming in on 300 watt hours per kilogram. Um, new kid on the block, lithium solid state, not quite there at commercialization yet, but certainly lots of investors getting excited about it. We are not going to see battery 1K this decade, but I would argue we need it if we're to hit those 2050 net zero targets. Now is the time to start working on it. And the question is, what if? Every pitch we've heard has asked the question, what if? What if we could disaggregate our, our, our freight? What if we could beam power from location to location? And we ask here the question, what if we, the USA, could crack the holy grail of battery systems? That's what this guy needs to fly his plane. But it also has application in heavy duty, trucking, and marine. And when we get to marine, we have ships sailing in electrolyte, conductive electrolyte, with lots of oxygen available but we haven't got time to talk about that today. So please, please come and talk to us. Um, myself and my colleague, you will know us, we will be wearing these really cool hats, right? So when you see us around, come and talk to us. We want to hear about your ideas. And uh, if you feel too embarrassed to come and talk to me wearing this hat, 
send me an email. Thank you for listening. Okay, well that completes our fast pitches and now we're up to the question and answer. I, th I just wanna say though, uh, Haley, I think that you've raised the bar <laughs> on fast pitches now, we need, we need props, so we appreciate that. Um, the um, the uh, Oz behind the curtain has just written to me that there's very few, we thought we got some good questions, there's very few people using the QR logged on at the moment. So we'll, we'll get going, but if you have a question, Put it in the system um, on that. So we'd appreciate that. Did they make fun of me because I don't do tech well, but you, you do it much better than me. Okay, first question. I'm gonna go to this guy right here. I'm gonna go to, to Jake. Um, okay, Jake, uh, here's a question from the audience. If you make rail and water vehicles for disaggregated systems, won't that necessarily make them less efficient? That's a great question, Bob. <laughs> Not mine, but it's a, it's a great question, audience. Um, so yes, it would. Uh, part of the efficiency of rail and water comes from the fact that you're moving a lot of stuff on these large vessels. Um, like I mentioned, uh, energy efficiency is, is one reason that, that people have been scaling up. Um, but like I also mentioned, there is intrinsic efficiency in moving goods on rail and water as well. Uh, rail is about four times more efficient just because of the lower surface resistance between the, the metal wheel and the rail as opposed to a uh, metal or rubber uh, wheel on, uh, on a road. Um, and and the, the physics are more complex for water, uh, but it's actually on the same order of magnitude. Um, so, so yes, the, the smaller vessels would be less efficient uh, per container, but still beating trucks. Um, you could also claw back some of that efficiency lost in the uh, form of convoying, which would be, take the form of, you know, you may have seen it on the roads, but trucks moving in, in formation. Um, we could apply the same dynamics to trains on, on rail, right? Individual cars moving together to reduce air resistance, um, as well as in shipping, which has actually not been done before. Uh, you wouldn't be moving in a line, but instead of in a V pattern to reduce your wave making resistance. Uh, and it's been shown that you could actually get about 30 to 50% efficiency increases for the following vehicles uh, if these types of formations are used. Great, and can I just add that um, all the independent autonomous rail bogies, they do anticipate platooning. Yes, this is gonna be an integral part of the parallel system even more back. Yeah, great, thank you very much. Okay, here's one for Peter. Peter, the time scale for contrails is very different for CO2 in the atmosphere. How is the flux calculated averaged in your presentation? You, you might talk, can you repeat the last part? H how is the flux calculated um, in, how is the average flux calculated? The CO, the, the effect? Sure, sure. Um, I think the best way to look at it is if you look at a particular day, and, and yes, there's a long-term greenhouse gas and maybe water as an extreme shorthouse greenhouse gas because it, it can dissipate quickly or six to 10 hours, which is a much shorter time period than CO2, which can be up in the sky for hundreds of years. Um, if we were to fly every day, what, does the, what difference does it make? Because if we were to fly every day, and every day we were to put out contrails from aviation, in effect, we're getting the same radiator forcing, radiator forcing from, the, from, from both effects. Uh, the one we do, on, on the one side, if we, we mitigate the, the control uh, problem, we have a path to, to solving it tomorrow and it will immediately have an impact. Uh, CO2, there's still, even if we were to eliminate all CO2 emissions from aviation uh, today, it will still take a lot of time to get all the prior pollution out of the air. So I think that's one way to look at the problem. Yeah, good. Great, thanks so much, Peter. This one goes to Olga. Olga, how would wireless power transfer benefit cybersecurity, or would it? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, so that's a really good question. Uh, there's certainly opportunities uh, to do things correctly and do things incorrectly from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, I think we have to be very mindful of solutions that are secure or can be made secure, perhaps through authentication and encryption uh, solutions which cost power, so this is not a, a linear problem. There is a coupling there. Uh, but that, that is an excellent uh, idea for a potential area and a program 
brain and say, uh, cybersecurity implications. So thank you for that. Good idea. Well, I, I have a slight follow-up question, but if you could beam more power to it, you could process the process that could probably do better algorithms for security. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's, it depends how much power you can give it, how much processing power you can provide, right? Uh, and then you can have more sophisticated uh, solutions for securing your data. It's that we really put ourselves in a constrained situation when we don't have enough power. We have to optimize within what power is available, and there's not a lot of it with batteries. Yeah. Well, that's a great point, and an excellent question. Okay, for Hallie. Hallie, what size battery, in terms of energy capacity, would a regional airplane actually need? Like, how big is that baby? It's big. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we're talking in a sort of 50 megawatt hour kind of range. Is that right, Peter? I think that's the right range, yeah. So Peter and I are working on this together. I do the chemistry piece, and he does the mechanical piece. And hopefully we'll end up with something that works. But yeah, 50 megawatt hours is about what we think is necessary. And if you uh, add the, the density, the specific density, the volumetric density has to be also evaluated properly. Okay, great. Well, here's one for me. Here's one that we could all sit down and have a couple of beers over, I think. Um, wh um, why is there an assumption that humans will make better decisions than AI? And why would a human in the loop be more ethical? <laughs> so there, there, there's so much to unpack on that one. But let me just say, almost all the famous examples you know about bias in AI is really, at first it was because people weren't removing biases from the training data. Then they did remove the, the biases they thought from the training data. And then they just realized that people are biased, right? <laughs> so the training data was biased, and I think a fundamental issue here is that we first need to agree on the ethical principles. And then we really, when we train systems or we embody those, we have to be sure that there isn't, for example, some residual bias in that. And if you ask me the philosophical question, I can answer one thing. Autonomous vehicles will drive better than the average Boston driver. That I guarantee. There's no, there's no doubt about that one. Will they be more ethical? And I think there that just comes down to, do we want them to emulate us, and would we ever agree on an ethic? Um, and I think that that conversation is important um, since it really will, will be crucial to AI moving forward. So I can add to that, Bob, if you want. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So the way I look at it, this is, you saw this this morning, it's the electrification of everything. We're going to see more intense applications around us electrify. And those machines or, or systems are going to interact with humans in a physical way. So they have to be more secure and have to be more trustworthy. Instead of a toaster or a TV, it might be a robot moving around your house where your children also play. So how do we get control logic and control logic inside of our electronics at the level where they can make those kind of decisions? And it, those might be some of the challenges we see in our future. Our grid might have advanced algorithms. And I think those are the opportunities also that are why it's an extremely exciting time to be working in energy and working as an engineer in the space and working in the sciences because the electrification of everything will with that also require a next level of controls, a next level of, of cooling systems, a next level of everything as we have to go toward a future where these systems can, can interact with us in different ways than we can imagine today. Great, thanks for adding that. Okay, let's see, oh, let's go to Jake again. So Jake, to disaggregate rail, don't you need to invest in infrastructure to create more rail lines to connect smaller locations? So I think our rail infrastructure is currently very uh, underutilized. Um, class one rail is, is basically how we move all of our freight today. Uh, and those are the, the big rails that, that move between cities. But we also have class two and three rails, which, which used to be used much more, um, which can you know you take smaller uh, locomotives and cars, but they are not currently used as much as they were in the past. Um, you know, if you have more trains moving on a single line, uh, you would have problems with them, for example, passing each other if they're you know going opposite directions. Um, but you do have sidings for that. You have places that trains can pull over into sidings and let others pass. And actually, aggregated trains, the, the longer and longer trains are up to you know, miles long these days, 
are actually running into problems where they can't fit in the sightings that exist. Um, so, you know, going to larger scales has actually reduced the amount of infrastructure available to us, and, and going back to smaller scales would open up a lot of that infrastructure which does exist, but is currently not used. So as a self-confessed train aficionado, you know, I think in a sense what we'd be doing is taking a step back. You know, uh, not all history is bad, right? We used to have extensive networks of, of rail lines and stations all the way through America. Maybe we just got rid of a few too many and we need to take a step back to, to get to where we need to get to in order to have a successful n rail network in the future. And, and I'll add the, the micro-terminal concept here is, is extremely important, meaning that we wouldn't have to rely on those fewer and fewer existing, you know, train terminals. Um, if you were able to, say, deploy a, a, a machine that could move a cargo container from a train to a truck wherever you want it, not only at the place where the infrastructure has been built and, and is permanent, um, but, but something modular and deployable uh, would really open up the possibilities as well. I think there's all, all excellent points. Okay, this one goes to Halley. Does the system in Battery 1K, I mean, you've already coined Battery 1K, that's, that's beautiful, need to be electrochemically reversible by requirement, or can it be mechanically recharged? Great question, great question. I think um, both options are valid at this time, right? We're doing what our breed does. We're asking questions about what might be possible, and both systems which are mechanically rechargeable and electrically, re re electrically rechargeable we want to hear about. So yes, both. Great. Thanks, Allie. Okay. Oh, and I should add, Okay. you know, when you start breaking down what a plane has to do, it needs 30%-ish, 20, 30% as reserve. That reserve can be something different again, right? That actually could if you think about it. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> okay, I think this one might make Olga, Olga smile. Does your research cover long distance wireless charging for aviation? Is that an interest area for your group? Um, so, I absolutely. I think that as we improve our technologies um, so that we can have more efficiency in our power transfer, we can open up all these more ambitious applications. Um, I do think wireless uh, charging for aviation would be super exciting. You could do it in flight, right, uh, for example. And uh, you see examples of that. People are thinking about it for drones. You can think of it as a forerunner for the aviation industry. Start small, you know, show, show uh, good results, and then scale. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, absolutely yes. Great. OK, I, I'll take one. Um, when multiple or many AI subsystems interact, is it possible to readily moderate or control, um, control the system? This is a fantastic question. Uh, this is the perennial trade-off between performance and safety and so on. Look at if you want the thing to be high performance, right, you want it making those decisions on the fly, tuning, getting every little thing out of it. If you want it to often be a little safer to put a governor, a moderator on it, whether that's another AI system or so on, you usually you usually have to take out some of that performance. I see Mario, our expert on control, I think maybe I got that right. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a perennial problem. Again, it's a balancing act. We're going to have to choose. And certainly when it, um, when it comes to safety and so on, look at, you, you can tailor systems to be more safe. If they sense a fault or a, a fault coming, they bring themselves to a safe state. But then you have to recover. So the, all of those issues are completely relevant to trustworthy AI. I don't think they have one simple answer, but they, they, were, all, they were all great questions. Thank you. Okay, I think we need one for Pete, Peter. Um, oh, here's one, Peter. I think this is up your pass, too. Do you also envision innovations in combustors to mitigate contrails? I think there's a, uh, I want to just like Halley, keep that open. I think once we first understand all the sensor parameters that are needed to give that pilot that light so he actually knows what, that we're generating a contrail that at that time contributes to radiative forcing, then we can look at a variety of solutions that can actually potentially explore how to solve that. As I said, uh, combusting products do form nucleation sites. You could also say, I'm going to just want to run my exhaust a little hotter. Maybe I'm going to heat up my bypass. 
uh, I'm, maybe I'm going to hit my, my, my water coming out with ultrasound, maybe I'm going to capture my water, maybe I'm going to capture my combustion. I think there's a whole portfolio of solutions that could be explored, and I think all of those are, are, are of interest. But I think the first part needs to be resolved first. I would like to get to a point where an airplane flying live can know <coughs> I'm generating a persistent control that contributes to radiative really forcing. And Bob, as I may, I found actually a nice way to connect all of our teams in transportation. Uh, we need an, a disaggregated uh, airplane that flies on batteries and gets some extra battery power from, from a laser beam uh, flying well, on thrust 40 AI. This sounds like a program. <laughs> yeah. This sounds like a program. Nice work. See, this is how we do it. This is how we do it. You're seeing it, you're seeing it in real time. Um, let's see, <laughs> yeah. Another one for Halley. Um, why is it that we should work, ooh, towards a 1K battery and not use something like hydrogen fuel cells? And the answer simply is we need to do both, right? Uh, my um, fast pitch was really about lower range uh, regional jets. I think we really are pushing the uh, limits of battery there, but if we want more oh, than 700 okay. nautical miles, we're going to need yeah. alternatives, and yeah. hydrogen yeah. is a very good alternative. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to be straightforward mm -hmm. and there aren't lots and lots of challenges. Uh, I was talking to some folks from Collins Airspace at the uh, at lunch. I mean, there's lots of challenges. Ultimately, we're going to need every oh, different mm -hmm. solution. Oh, it's not one solution. Sure. It's a multiple of solutions. If targets that we we're headed for. Great. Well, I have a flashing red light that's over a couple minutes. So I believe that that means that we have to end this fast pitch session. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we had a lot of fun presenting it, and we look forward to future discussions. Thank you very much. See you the rest of the day.